But the purpose of this session now is to talk about teacher learning. And the broad premise of this sesh discussion is that we've been wasting our time for the last 25 years. Some of you, I can see, are old enough to have had 100 Baker Days. If you don't know what a Baker Day is, you're not old enough to have had 100 of them. <laughs> and how many people think that the Baker Days made them a better teacher? Anybody? No. So, we have to think in a more careful way about what makes for effective professional development. And some people say that professional learning communities are the answer. The National College for School Leadership produced a, a glossy pack on professional learning communities. And the problem is that they put the cart before the horse. Abraham Maslow once said, he who is good with a hammer tends to think that everything is a nail. And the problem is that what they did was they started with a process and then worked out the, the content. So they said, right, we're going to have professional learning communities. What are they for? Oh, I don't know yet, um, but we'll think up something, you know. Professional learning communities are the answer. Now, what was the question again? So what I'm suggesting is that in any approach to, to school improvement, the, the basic heuristic should be content, then process. First decide what it is you want to help improve, and then decide how to go about it. And although I didn't go over it in detail this morning, the content is that the evidence we have is that there's nothing that you could be doing that's more powerful than formative assessment in the classroom. That's the evidence base. But then, unlike most researchers, Paul Black and I went a bit further than most researchers and actually worked out what would that look like in the classroom. But I have to say that my view about what good formative assessment looks like hasn't changed in the last 12 years. My idea about what should be happening in those classrooms hasn't changed. What has changed is my understanding of how complex it is to get that. If you go and look at the blogs that <coughs> popped up after the TV program last week, one of the interesting things was that there were people who were outraged that I was pret pretending that these things were new. You know, they were saying you know, that there's nothing new about these techniques, and that's absolutely right. But the fact is that while in many schools these are standard operating procedure, in many other schools they're not. And so it just shows how hard it is to try and move systems. And one of the interesting things about research is that most people in research tend to work with a small number of teachers. And I used to do that. You know, in the Kent and uh, Oxfordshire project, we worked with 24 teachers. And it was, a, it was great fun. But showing that when we work face to face with 24 teachers, and they get better results as a result of that, is not very useful when you have 300,000 classrooms in the United Kingdom that we need to improve. So we've been thinking about how do you do this at scale? And the, and the process model, I think, builds on th five elements. Choice, flexibility, small steps, accountability, and support. So the first part is choice. Why do we give teachers choice? Back in 1980, a man called Meredith Belbin wrote a book called Management Teams, Why They Succeed or Fail. He worked at the Staff College, um, and he used to get people to work together in teams on problem-solving tasks. And he was interested to know, when do these teams work well, and when do they fail? And what they f he found was that they failed when there weren't enough people playing certain kinds of roles. He thought there were basically eight team roles, which he called company worker, innovator, shaper, chairperson, resource investigator, monitor evaluator, completer finisher, and team worker. Later in his career, he added a ninth, which was a, a provider of specialist information. But these team roles, he thought that for a team to work well, you had to have, have somebody in the group able to play each of these. And so where people could actually play with these roles, the teams worked, and where they couldn't, they didn't. One of the most significant things about what Belbin said was that each role has strengths and allowable weaknesses. So often you find people who are very good at having ideas are not very good at finishing things off. Traditionally, the approach to performance management of these people was to get them better at finishing things off. And what they discovered was it doesn't work. And what they've discovered in business is it's far more effective to help them focus on their, on their strengths and to complement them with people who complement their weaknesses. 
And this has now led to something called strengths-based professional development in business. And, but it, we still haven't got it universally. I did a 360-degree appraisal last year. Do you know what that is? We, I filled in a questionnaire about my style, and then people who report to me fill it in about me, and my boss fills it in about me, and people at my same level fill it in about me. So I get my feedback. On one side of the page is, a bar, is some bar charts showing strengths. What do you think the other side of the page was called? Areas for development. What a load of crap. <laughs> I'm 55. I am not going to change. Deal with it. <coughs> the point is that it is not, I mean, they should have called them weaknesses. They are things that I'm not as good at. And I'm very happy to admit that I'm not as good at those things as I am at other things. But it's wrong to assume that you need to work on weaknesses. Now, some people's weaknesses, some teachers' weaknesses, are so egregious that immediate attention is required. But for most teachers, their students will benefit more by helping those teachers become really outstanding at the things they're already good at than to work on their weaknesses. The teachers we worked with in Medway, uh, there were two science teachers in the same department. Um, the, the, the man we called Derek in the, in, in the book, He's the most skilled questioner I've ever seen. I'm watching him with a bunch of year eight or year nine students, watching him draw things out of them, watching him weave things together. You know, I'd pay money to sit in his classroom and just watch the skill of that performance. But if he's away, the learning is not very great because those students are still pretty much dependent on him. Now his colleague, Philip, in the same department, you walk into Philip's classroom and you can't find him sometimes because he's crouching down talking to, with some students. So when we talked about assessment for learning, it was natural for Derek to work on questioning and for Philip to work on peer assessment and self-assessment. The aim of professional development is not to make every teacher into a clone of every other teacher. And that's one of the places we've gone wrong. Teachers are brilliant when they are themselves. The most impressive teachers are unabashedly themselves, sometimes on overdrive. All of us teach by projecting a vision of our personality into the classroom and getting the students to buy into that notion. So it's a fundamental mistake to think that professional development can be one size fits all in something where creativity is as important as it is in teaching. Flexibility. Every teacher needs to change these ideas to make them work in their own classroom. The difficulty is that if you build in too much flexibility, then people will change things in ways that make them unrecognizable. One primary school teacher heard about these lollipop sticks with the children's names on, liked that a lot, so she actually got lollipop sticks with the children's names on, and then she glued two rabbit ears to each of these sticks, and then she gave them back to the students, and the students had to hold them up to show they were listening. And when the teacher was talking about this to her colleagues at one of these monthly meetings, uh, under questioning from her colleagues, she realized that she had lost the plot. <laughs> because they were saying, what's formative about that? How are, you, how are you getting information about your student's achievement? And she realized that she hadn't, she actually, well, her, she'd actually created a lethal mutation, in fact, because the intervention was no longer effective. And we see that all the time. Collaborative learning. Getting students to work collaboratively is one of the success stories of educational research. Does anybody feel confident that they know how to engineer effective collaborative learning? There are two principles of effective collaborative learning. Does anybody know what they are? And that's extraordinary when you think about it. When you think about, you know, the, the, the research on collaborative learning shows that you will approximately double the speed of student learning if you just get collaborative learning. And the research shows very clearly there are two key principles. And most people don't know what they are. Well, here, here's, here, here is the answer. One is individual, uh, well, so, well, probably the first one best to talk about is group goals. Group goals so the kids are working in a group, sorry, working as a group as well as just working in a group. So many teachers, when they organize group work, they just have students working in a group, but they're not working as a group. So the idea that it has to be a group goal. But there also has to be individual accountability. If you have a shared product as a result of group work, it's unlikely to be effective. 
because passengers can ride on the work of others. So for example, if they're building something together, then you can't tell that everybody's involved. But if, I mean, to take an extreme example, if you're designing an aircraft and you're responsible for the wings, the left wing, and you're responsible for the right wing, and you're responsible for the fuselage, and you're responsible for the tailplane, and you're responsible for the engines, then if you aren't doing a very good job on the engines, the rest of the group will give you a hard time about this because the whole thing won't fly unless you do your job right. And so the key things are group goals and individual accountability, so you don't allow passengers. And what's interesting is most teachers don't like doing that second bit because it's tough and it involves confrontation with students. One teacher does it like this. She sets the whole group a task like learning about continental drift by studying this chapter in a book and then she gives every student in the group a test and everybody in the group gets the score achieved by the lowest scoring member of the group. So because the students know that's going to happen, they don't let anybody slope off and not do the work because my score might depend on how well you work. Now, it's a very bad way of finding out how much everybody learned, but it's a great way of making sure that everybody's accountable for each other's learning. But building in that individual accountability builds in confrontation and builds in you know, things that are difficult to, to, to do. And that's why most people don't do it. One study found that only one teacher in 20 who said they were doing collaborative learning consistently implemented the things that made it effective. And part of that is because we have this, we have this idea that every teacher has the right to make up things for themselves. You know, that, that every, teacher's, every teacher's idea is a good idea. But part of it is that some of this is really very, very tough to do, and people don't like doing it, and therefore we need to think about how we can build in flexibility without making it too flexible so that it no longer becomes effective. So our, um, so our approach is we call, it, we call it tight but loose. Different innovations, so the effective schools movement, actually, AFL was another good example. AFL was so loosely framed that everybody, most schools could basically relabel their existing practice and say we're doing AFL. Chick, you know. So some reforms are so loose that you basically get to relabel your existing practice with the new label and claim you're doing it. Others are too tight. So the Montessori method, for example, there is reasonably strong evidence that it is effective, but it's very difficult to get people doing it. So it's not a recipe for national improvement. So we call it our approach tight but loose. So it involves an obsessive adherence to the central design principles with accommodations to the needs, resources, constraints and affordances that occur in any school or district, but only where these do not conflict with the theory of the intervention. And that's counter-cultural at the moment. When I was working with the SSAT, the Specialist Schools and Academies Trust, I was saying, and here's what we're going to tell teachers to do. And they, because their, their mantra is by schools for schools. And I'm saying, yeah, but if you let a thousand flowers bloom, you better, better be ready for 900 weeds. So the problem is that a lot of innovation is completely wasted. And I agree that most researchers failed to improve practice in the past, but that's mostly because it hasn't been well thought through. But the other extreme, that every teacher has to reinvent the wheel, is equally inappropriate. And there are some things that we've done that we think that we can show are really very important to build in. Choice is one example. So, for example, I just said why I think choice is important. So, in a school the other day, I was talking to the head teacher, and they said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we get everybody to work on the same technique for next week? And I said, no, it's a terrible idea. Because choice is a fundamental cornerstone of this approach. The idea that each teacher chooses what they think will make the most difference to their teaching. And so, when I, I said, if you give the teachers choice, you're doing it wrong, I said. And the, and the head was quite surprised, because people aren't used to being told, actually, no, you're doing it wrong. People often ask me, can we change this? And I said, yes, of course you can change it. You need to be aware that everybody who has changed it has made it worse, but of course you can change it. You know, I was emailing somebody last night. They bought the pack from the SSAT to do TLCs, and they did TLCs for a, for a little while, and now they have teacher learning communities, but a quarter of them are doing AFL, a quarter of them are doing behavior for learning, a quarter of them are doing um, gifted and talented, and a quarter of them are doing ICT. And I wrote back to the, to the person, I said, so three quarters of your TLCs are now working on things that don't make a difference to students' achievement. And he was quite surprised that I was actually challenging him in that way. 
But there is research evidence. You know, teachers love things like learning styles and brain gym. There is no evidence that learning styles has any relationship with student achievement. Teachers love the stuff on learning, learning styles. But attending to individual students' learning styles has no impact on student achievement. And in fact, it could be a huge distraction. I was in a primary school the other day, and this little lad told me that he couldn't sit still in the chair because he was a kinesthetic learner. <laughs> Can I ask you to fold your arms? Now do it the other way. Um. Folding your arms the way you naturally do it is like learning in your preferred learning style. It feels effortless, comfortable, and natural. Folding your arms the other way feels really clumsy and uncomfortable and unnatural. But for most people, that's the first time they actually ever realize that one hand is up and one hand is down. So sometimes learning outside your preferred learning style leads to deeper learning because you're forced to think about things in a different way. And there is research to show that learning outside your preferred learning style can lead to deeper and longer lasting learning because of the cognitive engagement required. So there is no requirement for teachers to try and customize their teaching to meet individual students' learning styles. What you should do is to vary your teaching style so that all your students get some experience of being within and some experience of being without their preferred learning style. Brain gym is completely bogus. Its scientific basis is completely bogus. They claim research evidence, but curiously, all the publications that they cite as showing evidence of the efficacy of Brain Gym occur in a magazine called the Brain Gym Journal that I've never been able to track down a copy of, either online or in print. There is not one study of Brain Gym in, an, in a peer-reviewed research journal in psychology. And yet, of course, people love doing this because it's, no, it's a bit of a novelty. But I think that Given the fact that for your students, schooling is a one-shot deal, if there's evidence about what, what does work, then frankly, it is self-indulgent to play around with things that may or may not work. So the tight but loose form formulation is actually saying, get with the program. Until you can actually say, I mean, and here are my success criteria. If I walked into any of your schools, would it be the case that in 80% of the lessons, the teacher gets cognitive information from every single student at least once. The idea of a, 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 hinge, a, a question using ABCD cards or finger voting. You know, could I be guaranteed to see that at least once every 30 minutes? If I looked at their books, would the feedback be providing a recipe for future action? Would I see students not being given tokenistic learning objectives for the lesson, but other students really are able to understand what would count as a good piece of work here? Other students constantly um, supporting each other in their learning and other students monitoring their own learning and are active and metacognitively engaged in their learning. If you, if you can't say yes to all those questions, then AFL isn't embedded in your, in your schools. Now, the way that we tackle this issue of flexibility is to say that the five strategies of assessment for learning or formative assessment, sharing learning intentions, eliciting evidence, feedback that moves learners forward, students as owners of their own learning, and students as learning resources for one another, those five things are always a good idea. There are, there are no circumstances under which doing that is not a smart thing to do. But how you do it requires careful choice. Sometimes a technique might be right, sometimes a te te technique might be wrong. Some teachers, for example, like using lollipop sticks with year seven students, but they don't like using them with year 12 students because they think it's a bit babyish. Actually, I've seen it work very effectively with A-level further math students because you know, when you're picking on 18-year-olds and at random, the first thing that goes through their mind is, why are you picking on me? And with the lollipop sticks, the answer is, it's your unlucky day, deal with it. Now, what's the answer to my question? So, some, so for the teachers who think that works for them, it usually does. But the important thing is the choice of technique is up to the teacher. And that does three things. First of all, it allows teachers to customize and to build in variation that caters for the local context. Secondly, it creates ownership. And thirdly, it shares the responsibility. One of the things I found is that if, if you ever tell teachers what to do in their classroom, they will go, some of them will go away and try it. And they'll come back and say, I tried what you told me to do and it didn't work. 
But when the teachers have actually themselves chosen to try a technique, then we find that they are far less likely to say that. They usually, they usually make it work because it's their choice. Experts are very opportunistic. But the interesting thing, of course, is experts get deflected, but they only get deflected when it's going to be useful in terms of the students' learning. Novices get deflected and just head off in completely wrong directions. Um, and perhaps most interestingly, experts begin to solve problems slower, but bring richer and more personal sources of information to bear on the problems <laughs> they're trying to solve. And this idea of expertise is very important, because there's a whole literature about teachers' resistance to change. If you Google teacher resistance to change, you get hundreds of thousands of hits. And it's, it, you know, there, there are jokes about it as well. You know the old light bulb jokes? How many psychoanalysts does it take to change a bulb? Well, only one, but the bulb has got to want to change. How many teachers does it take to change a light bulb? Change? That's the joke. And as a teacher myself, I regard that as slightly pejorative. So I began to think about why it was that teachers couldn't change. And it's because of the expertise. It's because expertise is specific. Think back to when you were learning to drive. Can you remember the first time you approached a roundabout? And remember, and, and, and think back to when you first realized you were going to have to brake, change down gear, steer, indicate, use the mirror, all at the same time. You, your, you felt your head was going to explode, didn't you? There's so much going on. And what happened? You made most of those operations automatic through repetition. And the great thing about these operations, once they're routinized or automated, is they take up no brain space at all. So now you can carry on having a conversation with your passenger. The downside of that kind of routinization is it means that once those things are routinized, they're very hard to change. So if you discover that you're slipping the clutch, then it's a very hard habit to break. And that's where all teachers are. Teachers are experts at what they do because they get through the day with their current routines and changing that to make it better makes you a bit worse to begin with. One teacher described it as, it's a bit like doing engine repair in flight. It's very scary because it's messing about with what gets you through the day in order to get better at it. Expertise is also interesting in the way that it's almost impossible to reduce to words. This is quite an interesting clip because, uh, interesting study because they prepared six video clips of people doing CPR, just, just few short extracts of video of people doing CPR. Five of the video clips were students who were learning CPR and one was of an experienced paramedic. And the videos were shown to different people and they were asked, who would you want doing CPR on you if you needed it? The experts picked the one expert 90% of the time. The students picked the expert 50% of the time. And the instructors, the people who teach other people how to do CPR, picked the expert 30% of the time. Spend a minute on your tables discussing why you think the instructors so rarely pick the expert. <laughs> okay, could you give me a number between 1 and 20 apart from 7 and 15? Because new students would be more precise on the step by step, whereas an expert might have let their practice slip and be more confident but less likely to do the procedure precisely. Okay. Thank you. I didn't think sloppy, thought um, relaxed, more mm -hmm. confident, relaxed. and therefore did it almost as an automatic reflex, therefore didn't even though it was a serious situation, perhaps make it look as if they were taking it as seriously right. as the students did. Okay. So it could be just fluency and, re and being relaxed makes it look as if they aren't maybe as taking it as seriously. Um, and that, between the two of those responses, that's pretty much what the research has concluded. They concluded that the instructors looked for the people who enacted the rules of CPR that they taught. And often the experts didn't do that. But as, as you said, it, it's not that the experts don't, do, don't follow the rules, because if that were the case, if all the experts followed, did their own thing, experts wouldn't be able to spot experts. But 90% of the experts chose an expert, chose the expert. 
So what is interesting is that expertise is something that can probably be recognized by other experts, but can't be reduced to words or procedures or rules. And that's why we've been going wrong for the last 25 years. Because we've been trying to tell teachers what to do. Tell it, now, I have no, if, if I could tell teachers what to do with a guarantee it would improve outcomes for students, I would do so if I was a head teacher and I would fire anybody who disobeyed me for gross insubordination. Because schools are there for kids, not for, not for you. But the reason that we can't do that is because your classrooms are too complicated. There is no way I can predict all the complexity of things that will happen. And sometimes what might be the right thing to do in one situation will be exactly the wrong thing to do in a situation that looks very similar. That's why teaching is a profession. It's not a profession because we like being professionals. It's a profession because you are required to make decisions under, condi uh, uh, under conditions of uncertainty. So yeah, I mean, for me, there are two hallmarks of a profession. One is decision-making under uncertainty. And the second is willing to have your decisions uh, reviewed by a professional community of peers. So in other words, you, you know that you're going to make judgment calls, you're not going to get it right every time, but you accept that it is reasonable for a community of your peers to look at what you did. So what we know is more than we can say, and that's why most professional development has been relatively ineffective. For the last 25 years, We've, in effect, been trying to get teachers to think their way into a new way of acting, and it hasn't worked. And now, I think it's time to try getting teachers to act their way into a new way of thinking. We wouldn't have very good, uh, David Beckham would not be as good as he would be, as he, as he is now, if we'd required him to, to train by watching video and reading books. At some point, you have to get out there and do it. And I think one of the problems was, that happened with this was when schools of education got moved into universities. Ken Robinson jokes that for academics, bodies are just things for moving their brains around with. And, and academics tend to make things very cerebral. And I think what people forget about teaching is that it's an embodied physical activity. Most PGCE courses rarely have voice coaching anymore. But when it was in the normal colleges, when it was in the colleges of education, it, it was a much more physical activity because they recognized the physicality of teaching. So this idea of changing from thinking your way into a new way of acting to acting your way into a new way of thinking, I think is a very powerful metaphor for thinking about change. Because if you don't change what teachers do in classrooms, students don't benefit. If you, all you do is change teacher thinking, but don't change what they do, there is no benefit for the students. Students benefit only from changes in what teachers do. And that's why we have a lot to learn from Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers ought to be the least successful organization on the planet, because everyone who wants to lose weight knows what to do. Eat less, exercise more. That's it. There is no third secret. You don't get told the magic secret by paying your subs to Weight Watchers. That, you know, if you stir your cornflakes anti-clockwise, it'll convert the dextrose into left-handed sugar molecules that are not absorbed by, no, I'm sorry, no, it's just eat less and exercise more. That's all there is. So why does anybody join Weight Watchers? Because Weight Watchers have realized that they're not in the knowledge giving business, they're in the habit changing business. And if you want to get serious about improving teaching, you better get into the habit changing business too. Every teacher in your school learned most of what they know about teaching before their 18th birthday. The research on parenting shows exactly the same thing. The research on parenting says, shows that you can basically say, I'm never going to do that to my kids, I'm never going to do that to my kids, but after the third one of those, you are on autopilot. And I don't know about you, but I've been horrified by the number of times I've heard my father's voice come out of my mouth. Why? Because there isn't time to think. Parenting, like teaching, is, one, is a process in which there isn't time to think and you're just reacting. So what we need to do is to create situations where we help teachers change those habits. And it takes time, because the, the hardest bit is not getting new ideas into people's heads, it's getting the old ones out. And the most natural of all is that it's a good idea for kids to raise their hands in classrooms. It's the most natural thing in the world, and it's counterproductive. But it doesn't happen naturally. If it did, the most experienced teachers would be the most productive, and that's not true. Interestingly, expertise in teaching seems to develop at the same speed as expertise in cardiac surgery. 
one year's training in cardiac surgery <coughs> improves performance by one third of one standard deviation. So that means that a really great, a really great cardiac surgeon on their first day is better than the average cardiac surgeon after six years of training. Right, slightly, in, in, in teaching, it's even worse, actually, because the, the improvement in most teachers is so small that the great teacher on their first day is usually, is, is usually better than most experienced veterans. So what we need to do is to create time and space for teachers to reflect on their practice in a structured way and learn from mistakes. And this is not just teach, allowing teachers just to tell stories. It needs to be a structured way. Now, Esther Dyson points out that there's no excuse for making the same mistake over and over again. But there's also no excuse for making no mistakes at all. Like Marianne Ratti, the racing driver, once said, if everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. So what we need to do is to allow situations, encourage people by saying, always make new mistakes. Let's make new mistakes today. Uh, or as Samuel Beckett said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And I think this idea of fail better needs to be the, the, the rallying cry for all teachers. Why? As I said earlier, our daily experience as teachers is a failure. If you're not failing, then you're not actually paying attention because you just didn't, you didn't realize how badly you failed. But what happens to the teachers who don't think they're failing? Those are the teachers who think that they can't get any better. So what, if you feel you can't get any better as a teacher, then you have to blame all subsequent failures on the students because otherwise it's your fault and you can't get any better and therefore you are a bad teacher. An amazing number of people email me and say, do I have a, a, a measuring instrument or a protocol for assessing how good teachers are at doing AFL? And I say no, because I have no interest in doing that. I'm interested in whether teachers can get better. So for me, I'm far less interested in about judging teachers because there's no, there's no point in it. Chris Woodhead famously reckoned there were 15,000 incompetent teachers. Now, nobody knows where he got that number from, but even if he was right, if there are 15,000 teachers who are not good enough to be in our schools, sacking every single one of those and replacing them with average teachers would improve national standards by 1 40th of one grade at GCSE. It's a distraction. There may be some teachers who aren't very good, but most of them can improve. So here's, my, here's what I would say. If I was a head teacher now, I would ask every single teacher this question. Do you need to improve? If they say no, fire them. <laughs> there is no place in the state system for teachers who don't believe they can get better. But if they say yes, they can improve, then you say, and what, are you, what do you want to work on getting better at? And I think that question, do you need to improve, just <laughs> parses the world into two sets of people, one of whom you should get rid of and the other who, that you should work with. Now this change is actually very hard to do. I said earlier, I teach, teachers should be allowed to make small steps. Why? Because teachers are rarely conscious while teaching. It's just too complicated. It's too demanding. There's no brain space left. Can you feel your feet on the floor? Well, you can now, but 10 seconds ago you couldn't. Your brain <coughs> receives about 10 million bits of information from the eyes, but you get to be aware of about 40 of them. Which is why, at the end of the day, if I've got an extra bag to take home, I put it right by the doorway, and at the end of the day, just walk straight past it. It's why, when you're not looking for a house, you never see estate agent signs, and when you're looking for a house, they're everywhere. What you see is a very small proportion of what you actually see, and is your unconscious deciding what you get aware of. So what you see is not what you see. In fact, it's really quite strong, this effect. Can you put your hand fully extended like this, and look at the back of your hand, and then put the other hand about halfway? Now, the laws of physics are telling me, are guaranteeing for me, that the nearer hand should be four times the area of the, of the further hand. Is that what you're seeing? Half the distance, four times the area. 
No question. There are four times as many rods and cones being activated at the back of your eye by that nearer hand as by the further hand. Okay, thanks. That's not what you were seeing, is it? No. This message gets to your brain and it says, this nearer hand is four times the size of this further hand and the brain says, stuff that. I know these two things are the same size. I've had them for years, you know. <laughs> so your brain actually interferes with even the sense data to process it in terms of your existing experience. So what you see is not what you see. Even spookier, when you see it is not when you see it. You're, you're thinking that you're hearing me as I'm speaking, but actually your perception of what I'm saying happens half a second after you actually heard it. It's called a half second delay. And it appears to be the result of evolution. Um, it's to do with the way that information arrives in your brain. If I'm playing tennis and I hit the ball, I see the ball hit the racket at the same time as I feel the impulse of the ball come up my arm. Those things I experience as simultaneous. A moment's reflection should convince you that those two things can't possibly be simultaneous because the light travels far faster than the nerve impulse up my arm. And what happens is your brain waits until all this stuff is in before it decides to present a coherent model of this to your consciousness. Which is why sometimes you can turn to look at a clock with a second hand that clicks around once every second and be absolutely sure that it was stationary for more than a second. It's also why when you're walking down the stairs at night and there's one fewer step than you expected, it's so disorienting because it, it takes your brain half a second to work out what it thought was going to happen didn't actually happen. And it also explains why when a footballer is faced with an open goal and takes the shot without thinking, they often score. When they stop to think about it, they screw up. It's that breakdown of, of conscious and unconscious processing. And because the conscious and unconscious processes don't work well together, you have to be in one mode or the other, it explains why changing your teaching is hard, because teaching is a largely unconscious process, because speaking is a largely unconscious process. Somebody once said, when I speak, I discover what it is I wanted to say. Changing the way you write is very easy because it's a conscious process. Changing the way you speak, changing the way you react to students' responses is very hard because it's a largely unconscious process. I was working with a teacher the other day and she was trying to use no hands up and she was teaching year seven and year eight and she was, she was almost in tears. She was saying, every time I ask the students a question, I always say, does anyone or has anyone? So she was always inviting the students to raise their hands. And she asked me, why am I finding it so difficult to change? We sat down, we worked out she's been teaching 22 years. We reckon that by now she's probably asked half a million questions in her classroom. When you've done something one way half a million times, doing it another way is hard. No one has cracked this business of habit change. In fact, even in hospitals in this country now, we know that the spread of vancomycin resistant and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus would be effectively controlled. The, these superbugs, they'd be controlled if we could just get everybody to wash their hands 90% of the time. And we can't, because changing habits is hard. So what is needed from teachers is a commitment to the continuous improvement of practice and a focus on those things that make a difference to student outcomes. So yes, all teachers need to change, and the changes should be focused on the things that make a difference to students, not brain gym and not learning styles. From you as leaders, I think you need to do two more things. You need to create that expectation. You need to keep the focus on those things that make a difference to student outcomes. And that's very hard. My wife is a head teacher and her school has just gone up in two years from the 50th percentile of value added to the 95th percentile. How has she done that? By being utterly ruthless about saying no. Can we do learning styles? No. Can we do brain gym? No. We're doing AFL. Can we do gifting? No. <laughs> she describes herself as being a deflective practitioner, not a reflective practitioner, a deflective practitioner. So when the local authority says you've got to do something, she says, we're not doing it. And the local authority says, but you've got to do it. And she says, we're not doing it because it doesn't help teachers improve their practice. The, the, it's the hardest thing in the world to keep the focus on the things that make a difference to student outcomes. And the same thing is true in business. You know, people used to say, when McDonald's became hugely successful in the United States, people used to say, well, what's so special about McDonald's? Why are they so successful? They keep their restaurants clean. What's so special about that? Don't know. Nobody else does it. It's, it's extraordinary how hard it is to do some of the very simple things. 
And what you also need to do is to provide the time, space, dispensation and support for innovation. So I think, for me, the top-down bit is, in every school, it, it, the head should be able to walk up to any teacher and say, what are you working at getting better at? It should be a natural part of the conversation with any teacher. What are you working on improving about your practice? But it should be entirely up to the teacher what they choose to work on, because they're the professional. Nobody can actually, in my experience, tell a professional what to work on better than they can tell themselves. And then supporting risk taking. Now risk, this risk taking is very difficult. In, many times teachers tell us that what we're asking them to do is very scary. One teacher described involving the students more in their learning as giving up control of his classroom. And so we are quite aware that teachers are quite risk averse. So we thought we'd actually look at places where teachers really did, where, sorry, not teachers, where other people really took risks. And we found this rather interesting case study of Great Ormond Street Hospital. About one in every 4,000 babies is born with a condition called transposition of the great arteries. So the aorta should come out to the left side of the heart and actually comes out to the right side of the heart and the pulmonary artery comes out where the aorta should. The result of that is that oxygenated blood comes from the lungs and is pumped by the heart back into the lungs and so no or very little blood gets back into the, body, the aorta and therefore to the rest of the body. And so this is obviously a very serious condition and for many years the best treatment was called the Senning procedure, where they created a small baffle inside the heart and made a hole in the ventricle wall to push some of the blood where it should be going. And they got quite good at this. So after, you know, after the first experimentation, seven out of every eight babies survived, but the life expectancy for people born with this procedure wasn't very good. It was only about 47 years. And of course, because their bodies didn't get much oxygen, they weren't able to be very active. So there's great interest at the hospital in improving the outcomes uh, and they looked at various ways, and the obvious one, of course, is to correct the plumbing. To cut the aorta, to cut the pulmonary artery, and to reattach them where they should be, in a two-week-old baby. This chart shows how they got on. So when they were using the early sending procedure, the early death rate was about 12%, and when they started experimenting with this new switch procedure, the death rate rose. This is where it would have been had they played safe, but it actually went up to 25% death rate. <coughs> but by the time they've done about 275 of these cases, they got perfect. But while they were learning how to do this operation, 15 more babies died than would have died had they played safe. And the outcome is shown here. The blue line shows the life expectancy curve for the population as a whole. So this is basically your chance of making it for one more year, given how old you are. So when you're 20, your chance of making it to 21 is just pretty close to 100%. When you're 80, your chances of making it to 81, not so good. The blue is the normal population. The green, those who had the setting procedure. The red, those who had the new switch procedure, reflected in a life expectancy improved by 16 years to 63 years. But the price that was paid was 15 babies died while the doctors were learning how to do this. So when teachers tell me that what I'm asking them to do is very scary, I say, get over yourself. That is scary. So accountability. The second part of accountability is making a commitment. We think it's very important that teachers make a written commitment to a group of their professionals about what they're going to try out. It's, it's very similar to the Weight Watchers model, isn't it? You, you, know, you are held accountable for sticking with the diet. It forces teachers to make their ideas concrete, makes the teacher accountable for doing what they promised, requires each teacher to smoke, focus on a small number of things. In my experience, if a teacher tries to change more than two things about their teaching at the same time, they will fail. And then what happens is they go back to what they feel safe with, and you end up making less change. It's the tortoise and the hare. The people who make the most changes are the ones who change slowly and most importantly, requires the teacher to identify what they will give up or reduce. You will encounter huge resistance if you try to get teachers to stop doing something they're already doing. And if you do try to say to them, you should do, you should do ne less marking, for example, to give more time to think, they will say things like, are you saying what I'm doing is no good? That's the standard reaction. And in indeed, many heads think that way as well. Many heads think that their job is to stop people doing bad things. But schools are places where almost everybody is so positively disposed towards the students that everything that everybody does is positive. 
So if you think that you can make your school better by stopping people doing bad things, you're probably wrong, because people aren't doing any bad things. The consequence of that, that most people don't grasp, is that therefore the only way to make your school better than it is now is to stop people doing good things, to give them time to do even better things. And if you can't do that, then your school won't improve. Your teachers are working as hard as they can at the moment. So the only way they're going to get better is by stopping doing something they're doing and replacing it with something that's more valuable, like marking. Stop doing marking so the teachers have time to think up good questions. And teachers say, I haven't got time to do this because I'm too busy marking. I explained to teachers that marking is the punishment that teachers have to do for not getting the learning right when the kids were in front of you. <coughs> we've all had the same experience, haven't we? we? We've taken the books in and we've had to write the same thing on 15 different exercise books because we didn't have the wit to ask them that question before they left. And so as our punishment, we have to put the kids' learning back on track one kid at a time after they've gone away. But had we front-loaded our effort, we could have actually had a good question. We could have asked the kids before they left, and we could have put the whole class's learning back on track in one go, orally. <laughs> so those are the kinds of changes we're talking about. So there's um, a, you know, the idea of, a, of an action plan, identifying something that the teacher will no longer do or will do less of. And teachers are quite resistant to this. Here's a quote from a teacher who, a year after this process, was reflecting on their experience of being forced to write their promises to the rest of the group on no carbon required NCR forms. And this is what he said. I think specifically what was helpful was the ridiculous NCR forms. I thought that was the dumbest thing. But I'm sitting with my friends, and on the NCR form, I write down what I'm going to do next month. Well, it turns out to be a sort of, I'm telling my friends I'm going to do this. And I really actually did it. And it was because of that. It was because I wrote it down. I was surprised at how strong an incentive that was to actually do something different. That idea of writing down what you were going to do, and then because when they come by next month, you better take out that piece of paper and say, did I do that? Just the idea of sitting in a group, working out something, and making a commitment. I was impressed about how that actually made me do stuff. Now, some teachers are good enough to be able to self-start this kind of process, but our experience is that most need support. The difficulty is that teacher learning is just like any other learning in a complex area. You know, most teachers still believe that they can do the learning for the learner. You know, when the pressure is on, when the tests are, lo are, are looming, we resort to telling, don't we? You know, hence the old joke about schools being places where children go to watch teachers work. I always tell teachers that if, you're, if your students are going home at the end of the day less tired than you, the division of labor in your classroom requires attention. But at one extreme, you have the teachers who try to do the learning for the learner. At the other extreme, you have the teachers who use the F word, facilitate. I don't teach, they say, I just facilitate learning. To which I say, so why are we paying you? Because as far as I can see, all you're doing is hanging around and waiting for some learning to happen. The best teachers have found a middle course between these two extremes. You can't do the learning for the learner, but you can't just hope for it to happen. You have to design an effective learning environment. And the task for leaders is exactly the same thing for teachers. You can't do the learning for the teachers, but just leaving them to their own devices produces change that is so slow, it's almost negligible. And in fact, in many experiments, they fail to, measure, fail to detect any effect at all. So what you can do is to engineer effective learning environments for teachers. And this is quite countercultural, especially now in this era of the heroic head, the, the executive head of a, of a federation of schools. But we're still locked in that heroic model. And as Jim Collins showed in from, from Good to Great, heroic, charismatic leaders are usually bad news. They destroy shareholder value at an extraordinary rate. Mergers and acquisitions tend to be driven by the needs of the people whose salaries will go up as a result rather than the needs of the shareholders. In fact, most, share, most mergers actually destroy shareholder value because they put these charismatic people at the top. I mean, Carly Fiorina, uh, Bob Nardelli at Home Depot, extraordinary uh, trashing of shareholder value because this thing about char charismatic leaders. The problem is for schools is that the only people who create value are those who are teaching in classrooms. That's where the value gets created. That's why Paul Black and I called our first booklet Inside the Black Box, because it seemed to us that most people were treating the, 
the classroom as a black box in engineering theory. They're measuring outputs, sometimes they measure inputs, but nobody's paying attention to what's going on inside the classroom. And the best heads know that the only way they can improve their school's results is to improve what happens in classrooms. They're working through other people. My mother tongue is Welsh, and in Welsh there's a famous legend of a giant called Bendigaidvran, who is leading his troops across the countryside, and they come across this big gorge with a river at the bottom, and the river is too deep to ford. There are rocks in the river that are so close together they can't use their boats. So they puzzle about how they're going to get the army across the other side, and eventually the giant decides that he will lay himself down and his troops walk across his back to get to the other side. The proverb that is still in use in Welsh today as a result of this legend is, he that would be a leader must be a bridge. And I think that's a very powerful metaphor for leadership in schools. Robert Greenleaf calls it servant leadership. He points out that in most organizations, the leaders are actually the servants of the lead. The job of a head teacher and other leaders in schools is to help every single teacher in every single classroom be more productive. That's the way the school gets better. And that's why we think these ideas of teacher learning communities are so powerful. We think that uh, as a result of quite a lot of experimentation now, I've set up 750 of these teacher learning communities in Scotland. Uh, there are probably even more in England now. <clears throat> Optimum size, 10 to 12. Composition doesn't matter very much, at least in the first two years. Frequency of meetings, monthly. People who've never been teachers and can't understand why you can't have meetings more frequently than that. Our experience is that basically most teachers take a month to try a new idea out. If you've never been a teacher, you don't realize how delicate and fragile most teachers' lives are. And most teachers, if you, if you have a meeting three weeks apart, many of the teachers won't have tried something out. A month is about optimal. Minimum length of time, 75 minutes. We've tried different lengths, they don't work as well. Time between meetings for collaborative planning and for peer observation. We think that every meeting should have the same structure. Exactly the same structure. People say, isn't that very boring? And it's interesting, we've looked at people, how people design CPD, and they're saying, we've got to do something different next time. Why? When you, when you keep on changing the structure of the learning, what happens is people are focusing on the structure rather than what they should be learning. And when you have the same structure for every meeting, people come to the meeting knowing what to expect. And so the structure of the meeting falls into the background and the learning itself comes into the foreground. And so we actually think that this structure, which we now, I was put, we, we, we've actually been running this structure now for about seven or eight years and we haven't managed to improve it. Um, and I was puzzling about that, but in th I think about it, it's so obvious really because you start off with an introduction, then a starter activity just to get people thinking and warmed up. In some schools, they have what they call a sparkling moment where everybody has to say something positive that a student has done. In some completely dysfunctional schools, we've actually allowed people the 30 second whine or rant. Everybody is allowed 30 seconds time with a stopwatch to sound off about the senior management, the students, the parents, the governors, whatever. Why? Because if you don't let it out at the beginning of the meeting, it often will keep on cropping up throughout the meeting. One teacher in Wakefield said, he, I love the 30 second whine. He said, I can now squeeze more whining into 30 seconds than I used to be able to manage in a whole two hour twilight session. <clears throat> but then the active ingredient is activity three, feedback. So uh, go around the table and everybody reports back on what they tried out and how it went and they're held accountable. A drip feed of new ideas about formative assessment and then personal action planning. For 15 minutes, so, so if you and I are gonna watch each other teach, we get our diaries out and we put a date in the diary because our experience is that if it isn't in the diary by the time we leave, it's not going to happen. And then review of learning. Did we achieve what we wanted to achieve? If yes, great. If no, what should we do about it? Now, now each group needs a leader or a facilitator and everybody worries about how should we train this person. Don't is my advice. This is meant to be a self-help group of experts who come together to get help from the rest of the, of the group for what they want to change about their teaching. It's closer to Alcoholics Anonymous than it is to other models of professional development. So it's not about telling people what to do. In fact, our experience is that when there's somebody in the group who thinks they're an expert on AFL, there's less learning because they tell people what to do. And local authority staff can be particularly dangerous in this regard. Here's why. First of all, many of them fondly imagine that when they were teachers, they used to do all this stuff, and they probably didn't. But much more importantly, as soon as you leave the classroom, you forget how hard it is to change. 
three weeks out of the classroom and you have this rosy view of, of how easy it must be to actually do all these things. And it's not because teaching is so absorbing, just so all-encompassing that changing is, is hard. So that's why we think that the important thing is that the, the, the leader of this group is just there to maintain the environment but not to be the expert. A quick word about peer assessment. In many schools, we've had some concern from unions that this is a form of creeping performance management. And the problem is that the term peer observation is used in some schools to describe a process where bosses look at the teaching of subordinates. And that's not peer observation in my, in my, in my language. Peer observation is genuine peers getting together. So you and I get together, not because somebody's told us to, because we want to help each other. So when you're in my classroom, I tell you what to look for. I'm working on my wait time. I give you a stopwatch, and then I ask you to measure my wait times. And here's the clincher. When you're in my classroom, you're working for me. So any notes you make belong to me. When I'm in your classroom, I'm working for you, and therefore any notes I make belong to you. You can allow me to keep a copy if you like, and that's why I think this is a genuine, another genuinely radical step in teacher professional development. We've wasted a huge amount of time on this idea of sharing good practice, which I think is a complete waste of time. Because most teachers have many, as many examples of good practice as they can use in the rest of their careers. Teachers are like magpies. They love picking up new ideas. And they go back and try it once in their classroom, and then they go on to something else. I was working with teachers the other day. I, I, well, it comes up all the time. I've lost track of the number of times teachers have said to me, oh yeah, I used to do that, it was good. <coughs> that school, Hartswood School, in the classroom experiment, did you know that in the, in the students' diaries, they already had red, yellow, and green pages to use as traffic lights? They were there. The teachers knew about them. I mean, I assume they looked at the diaries and thought, oh, what are these colored pages doing here? Sharing good practice is a distraction because we keep on flitting from one new idea to the next without getting good at any of them. And what we need is changes of habit. We need to help teachers move towards a time when their wait time is naturally three seconds, not because they, not when they remember to do it. So it's about helping change habits. And, and so the idea is that each person has a personal agenda for transforming their own practice and they get the support of others, which is why when people are in my classroom, they're working for me. If they get something out of it, that's great, but they're not there to learn. They are there to help me learn. Uh, just to finish this off, um, here's the school I was telling you about earlier, Edmonton County School, and here's their results. This is when they started doing TLCs um, with a pilot group. This is the second year, and then, so basically the, the bars are the CVA percentile, and, and that's just from being relentless about focusing on teachers getting better at their job. Stop everything else, get everything else out of the way, make sure that nothing interferes with teachers learning about how to do a better job in their classrooms. Okay, that's the next session.